Next, of course, is Esther Jackson, who is managing editor of Freedom Ways at the moment, and with the Southern Negro Youth Congress, served as administrative secretary and executive secretary. Uh, she attended the 1939 Congress and played a leading role from 1940 through 1946. Uh, went on from there uh, after leaving SNYC and played a leading role in the Civil Rights Congress. And I should also add, uh, knows more about these events than she's willing to let on. <laughs> <laughs> Esther Jackson. Uh, thank you, Jerry, for that very interesting introduction. Um, it was in 1940 that I answered an appeal from the SNYC to come to Birmingham. An appeal had been sent out to black youth to come to work for the summer as volunteers to work on the Right to Vote campaign and other activities of the Youth Congress. I had attended the Birmingham Conference in 1939 and had been greatly inspired so that when the invitation came, it was an opportunity not to be missed. The motto of the Youth Congress, we shall dream, organize, and build for freedom, equality, and opportunity caught the imagination of a whole number of Afro-American youth. When I arrived in Birmingham that summer, I was not quite prepared for the reign of terror there, the police brutality, even though I had come from originally from the state of Virginia. There was much fear and anger in the Afro-American community, whose downtown area in Birmingham was confined to about three city blocks. The Masonic Temple housed the Youth Congress, the Alabama chapter of the NAACP, the black law firm of Shores and Hollins, uh, the one I believe the only um, drugstore for blacks in the city, the small library on the ground floor with a few hundred books. We were not allowed to go into the city libraries in Birmingham at that time, which was true almost throughout the South, unless you were returning books of a white employer. Down the street, two restaurants, Nancy's Cafe and Bob Savoy, a few bars, and one movie theater. On a Saturday night, as we often worked in the Masonic Temple building and the SNYC offices, writing and running off literature, leaflets to be passed out in the churches um, the next morning. We were always at the churches on Sunday morning either with a flyer about some victim of police brutality, or perhaps a flyer with instruction on how to register to vote. We would often hear other shootings and beatings in the alley behind the Masonic Temple building and have to investigate. And therein, another case. Most of the bus drivers in Birmingham at that time carried guns on their hips so that you know that the Jim Crow seating patterns in all public transportation was rigorously enforced. At that time, there was a nationwide um, voting campaign with headquarters in Washington, D.C. It was headed up by Congressman Lee Geyer of California and Vito Marcantonio of New York. They were, Geyer was the sponsor of a bill to abolish the poll tax. So that the SNYC joined in and launched a large scale assault on the poll tax. Several hundred youth met in Birmingham that summer in an assembly declaring that, and I quote from the call, 
the fundamental laws of our land grant the Negro people the right of citizenship and the right to vote. The resolution adopted at this conference stated, we will have attained real freedom when every adult citizen can go to the polls and register and vote. There were many materials produced, anti-poll tax buttons, often one worn by people in Alabama under their lapels or in a pocket for fear of losing their jobs or being stopped by the authorities. Uh, there was a stamp produced to put on letters and a major petition drive to bring the Geyer anti poll tax bill to the floor of the House. As a part of the campaign, we covered conventions, labor union meetings, church gatherings, sororities, fraternities, women's meetings. The national campaign had, its, had as its purpose to educate the American people to the fact that at that time, 19 million Southerners, not all black, some white, were denied the right to vote because of the poll tax, white primaries, grandfather clauses, which you heard Henry Winston mention, and other voting restrictions. In several cities of the South, including New Orleans and other places, mock conventions were held in public parks and classes were held on teaching people how to register to vote. Mass meetings were held in Birmingham in the adjacent towns of Ensley, Bessemer, Pratt City. Locals of the United Mine Workers, social clubs, and church groups participated in this campaign. Many people were registered. I don't have the exact figures, but it was remarkable considering what one went through to try to register to vote in the South at that time. It was normal to be asked very obscure questions on the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, by people who could barely read themselves. The right to vote campaign continued as a major focus of the SNYC for the 12 years of its existence. After the war, a second major drive on registering to vote was launched. In Birmingham, Henry Mayfield, who had returned from the Army, a coal miner and, and an activist in the SNYC, with Lou Burnham, led hundreds of black vets in a demonstration to City Hall demanding the right to vote. When Jack, Jim Jackson, returned from the Army, he organized a movement in Mississippi. Thousands of small leaflets were passed out in Mississippi with the slogan, Veterans, you who laid old Hitler low, don't be afraid of old Bilbo. <laughs> Just like Hitler's friend Tojo, Bilbo too has got to go. <laughs> and this is a picture of Jim Jackson and from a newspaper of the time, vets in Mississippi defy Bilbo, vote on his front porch. And here's Jim Jackson and here's the veterans and Bilbo was a notorious racist senator, as has been mentioned earlier. To, and so this was certainly a very brave but important step. Another major campaign of the Youth Congress when I first came to Birmingham was on the police terror. Bull Connor was chief of police. And if that name is familiar, it's the same Bull Connor who called the dogs and the hoses on the civil rights activists of the 60s. There were many cases, many of the details I can't recall, but let me cite one or two. Nora Wilson was a young black woman from rural Elmore County, Alabama. She was jailed in the Wetumpka prison for attempting to find out from her white employer why her younger sister was accused of stealing six ears of corn.
She was cited for assault and attempted murder and jailed. Somehow Jim Jackson and Malcolm Cotton Dobbs, a young white youth from Texas who was very active with the Southern Negro Youth Congress and with the League of Young Southerners, which was a youth branch of the Southern Conference for Human Welfare. Somehow they got into the prison. And perhaps Jack will be able to tell more about that than I can, but they were able to get out and report on her condition. And after a mass campaign, which became national, Nora Wilson was freed. Lou Burnham was the first to go into Mississippi and investigate the Willie McGee case, which became internationally known. And Jack and Lou were the only outsiders to get into Columbia, Tennessee and report what was going on when it was under siege and cut off from the rest of the world. Another campaign was called Common Courtesy on Common Carriers. Mildred McEldory Edelman, who is with us today, was a premature Rosa Parks. <laughs> Back in 1942, and I want to quote from the press release that was issued at that time, the heading said, Youth Leader Jailed and Beaten by Alabama Police. Bus driver orders arrest of four for moving Jim Crow sign on bus. For the crime of refusing to tell an irate bus driver which one of the Negro passengers had removed the colored white board, standard of Jim Crow in Southern transportation, 27-year-old Mildred McAdory was arrested, brutally beaten, and held in jail incommunicado. This is a very long press release, but what it finally says, we got um, attorney Arthur Shores to investigate the case, and Mildred was put on trial. And of course, you remember, this, this black lawyer was called boy all through the trial, and Mildred was called girl. And on the witness stand, the policeman and the bus driver gave a made-up testimony. The press release says, quoting Mildred, I was charged with interfering with an officer. One of the other men was charged with moving the board. The bus driver testified under oath that I said, where I come from, they didn't treat Negroes this way, and that I was tired of it. How he lied. I was born and reared in Birmingham, Alabama, and have only been out of Birmingham on short vacations. This thing that happened to me is a symbol of what can happen to any Negro, to you, your wife, sister, mother, or daughter. The buses over a period of time have been a sore spot to all Negro citizens. With transportation getting worse, these things will happen more often unless we stop them now. I am carrying the case of the brutal treatment by the arresting officer to the Civil Service Board. If the people will use this incident to correct the situation, the hardship and misery I suffered will be avenged. Let us unite now in a mass effort to end the intolerable treatment we have been, the victims on, of, on the streetcars and buses and at the hands of the police. It's an interesting to note, though, that Arthur Shores um, lived on Dynamite Hill, which was a section in Birmingham where so many black homes had been bombed. It was called Dynamite Hill. And after his defense of Mildred, sometime later, his home was bombed. And he was also, at one point, tar feathered and left on a country road. Free, uh, SNYC originally viewed with some skepticism on the part of some of the established black organizations and leaders, won the support of many sections of the black community throughout the South, as, as has been noted by Grace and Jack before. The church doors were open to us. In Birmingham, we were often at the 16th Street Baptist Church, 
where you may recall in September 1963, four children were brutally killed in a bombing. Union Halls, Mine Workers and Steel welcomed us. At Jack at one time with Pete Seeger and his guitar covered union meetings. At that time, in most locals, blacks sat on one side and whites on the other. We had to wage a battle about that also. Well, we set up some youth centers, which was one of the few places where black youth could gather. We issued manuals for college chapters so that most black colleges were open to us. And we turned out weekly, sometimes daily, press releases about our major campaign. Jack and I were arrested, for example, at the Pratt City Mine, handing out literature on the right to vote as the shifts changed. When the word spread that the manager had called the sheriff from town to pick us up, hundreds of miners came out of the mine and refused to go back to work unless we were free. They surrounded the shack where we were being held, and we were released at gunpoint, yes, and we were released. <laughs> the right to recreation was another campaign. In Birmingham, tip typical of those times, there was a park in the middle of the Afro-American community where one could walk through but dare not sit on the benches. The benches were only for whites. We collected thousands of signatures on petitions and finally the situation changed. We appeared before the city council so much until they got tired of seeing us, an unheard of thing in those days. We were there repeatedly. And we finally got a swimming pool, the first swimming pool for blacks in the city of Birmingham. This, this activity was repeated wherever we had councils and chapters. Another activity was culture and the arts. Uh, three old cars were donated to the Youth Congress from Friends in the North. They became the Caravan Puppeteers. We used them in Alabama, Louisiana, and Georgia, touring rural areas with plays on the right to vote, how to get justice from the plantation boss, etc. In the summer of 1940, Waring Cuny, a poet and friend of Langston Hughes, Arthur Peter Price from Tennessee, Bertha Boozer from, a, from Georgia, Ramona Lowe, a writer and actress from New York, <clears throat> lived together in a small apartment, literally covering the state of Alabama with the puppeteers, staying with anyone who could put them up, because as you know, no motels or hotels were open to blacks in those days. We set up community theaters, which were mentioned before in a number of places. And at that time, not only libraries, but museums, art galleries, and public concerts were off limits, except in those Jim Crow sections that we mentioned. Labor youth clubs of the SNYC provided educational and cultural programs, taught classes in history, current events, even reading and writing. More than 100 councils with memberships throughout the South were organized in such places as Irmo, South Carolina, Natchitoches, Louisiana, Hattiesburg, Mississippi. And we rode all over the South in the back of the bus. <laughs> we published Cavalcade, the March of Southern Negro Youth, a monthly journal for several years. Augusta Strong and Lou Burnham were the main editors. And artists who are now nationally famous, like Jake Lawrence, and Charles White and Bob Blackburn were called on to illustrate for us. They were part of the youth movement also. A successful labor school was organized in a number of places. In Montgomery, Alabama, when a council was organized, support came first from E.D. Nixon of the Pullman Quarters, who later put up the bail for Rosa Parks when she was arrested in the action which began the Montgomery bus boycott of the 60s. 
And it was Nixon also who selected the young Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., newly arrived in Montgomery as pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church to lead the Montgomery Improvement Association, lead the bus boycott, and thus help to initiate the movement of the 60s. There was a campaign for job opportunities. For example, as a result of our collecting thousands of signatures, the FEPC Fair Employment Practices Commission held a hearing in Birmingham and exposed citywide job discrimination. It was at Tuskegee Institute, Alabama, at the fifth conference of the SNYC in 1941, that Paul Robeson sang in the first integrated concert in Alabama history. And it was at the seventh conference in Columbia, South Carolina in 1946. This was the Southern Youth Legislature, attended by about a thousand black delegates and several hundred white Southerners, that Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, long a supporter and friend of SNYC, delivered his classic statement on the South in the speech which Jerry mentioned, Behold the Land, a speech that illuminated the basic nature of the social, political, and economic life of the South. The years that I spent in SNYC where I had come one summer as a volunteer and remained for nearly seven years, looking back after 40 years, I look back at the difficulties, the terror unleashed sometimes against us, the white citizenship councils around, the economic deprivation, as yet a most wonderful time. The lifelong bond of friendship of those of us here on this platform with Mildred McAdory Edelman, with Sally Bell Davis, mother of Angela, with Hosey Hudson, a leader in sharecropper struggles, steel, and in every other fight waged. Well, Hosey still calls us at 6 o'clock in the morning, as he did then, urging us to get on with the struggle. <laughs> I remember time spent with that great woman activist, Majeska Simpkins of South Carolina, who drove us all over the South when needed and with Langston Hughes when he would come south to read poetry in the churches of the south because there weren't many places open to black artists and, po and poets anywhere in the country and he covered the churches. And joking with his then attorney, Thurgood Marshall, who would, was traveling for the NAACP and he spent some time with SNYCs and he's now Supreme Court Justice Marshall the first black on the Supreme Court. And with the poets, William Stanley Braithwaite and Sterling Brown, with educators, Horace Van Bond and Charles Gamillion, who, who later we lived with for a short time, with Mr. Dr. Gamillion, and who gave up a car for our use in the South. And especially memories of Paul Robeson and Du Bois. We welcome foreign guests too, like Lyudmila Pavlichenko, honored Soviet fighter who toured the South after the war under SNYC sponsorship. And Southerners had the opportunity to meet this heroine of the Soviet people. I can recall <coughs> contacts with revolutionary youth from Asia, Africa, Central America, both through correspondence and our travel to conferences in such places as Cuba, of course pre-revolutionary Cuba, Panama City, Mexico, India, Paris, London, and the USSR. And some from other lands attended our conferences. I can also remember being called to the White House after many try times trying to see Mrs. Roosevelt. And I met and had tea with Eleanor Roosevelt, hoping to get her to use her influence to aid our as whites were, became a major campaign. On a personal note, I can recall going to a physician, for example, a specialist recommended by a white friend, 
and finding a very bright, sunny waiting room for white patients only, and directed to the back, to a small, dark, crowded room, and Jack and I, fleeing when viewing the separate instruments, rusty, broken, dirty. But I can also remember white youths like Polly and Tex Dobbs, Carolyn Ballin, and others, who rejected the immorality and hate of the South and joined in our struggles. We went on, Jack and I, to other work soon after the Columbia Conference in 1946. But the Youth Congress continued under the leadership of Lou and Dr. Burnham and others. It was an organization, as you can gather, that did help to change the South and to make the struggles of the 60s possible. And it changed the lives of all of those who experienced it. 